Kotlin has exploded in popularity over the past few years and has become the language for creating Android apps. But that wasn't the original plan. We've got the story on how that happened and how JetBrains built a community around Kotlin on this episode of Dynamic Developer. I'm your host, Bill Detweiler, and I'm talking with Hadi Hariri, VP of Developer Advocacy at JetBrains, about how the company, best known for IDEs, created a programming language and built a community around it, which helped it become the de facto language for building Android apps. Hadi, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Great to be on. So, so let's talk about JetBrains' experience with Kotlin and, and, and sort of building the community around uh, around it. Tell me how that came about. Um, tell me about the process for getting it started. Yeah, start kind of, you know, at the beginning. I, I mean, I think that when we started Kotlin, we basically had a community uh, established around JetBrains. So, I mean, you know, JetBrains this year was actually 20 years old. And we started Kotlin back in 2010. So we, we already had like 10 years of, um, uh, of head start in terms of building a community around mm -hmm. our, our brand and some of our products. So it's not, from one side, I would say like, it's not like we started on a clean state, right? Uh, but from the flip side of it, in a, in a sense, we did because, you know, we were, a, we were a company that was essentially building developer tools, IDEs. And while the majority of us, well, I mean, most of us are JetBrains, and I say that a lot of people in the community would accept that a language is also a tool, there seems to be some difference between a language and an IDE for many. So when we came out with, you know, the announcement that, oh, we're, we're, we're now creating a language, everyone's like, oh, you know, no, just, just stick to IDEs. We, we don't, you know, JetBrains shouldn't be doing languages. And we're like, well, okay. So it was quite challenging. It was quite challenging. Uh, and I think that, you know, it, it took many, many years, I would say, to start to, well, not many, many years. I mean, it took a good number of years for people to start looking at the language and building a community around it. And there were certain milestones that we hit that made this, you know, suddenly shoot really high and really fast. But at the beginning, it was, it was very, very challenging. What do you think that resistance was in the community that had already um, existed around JetBrains tools? I don't think it really is about JetBrains as a company itself, right? I, I think that, you know, people start to identify uh, and uh, identify certain brands for certain things, right? It, it's kind of like, you know... Um, Google is a search engine and they sell ads. And, and tomorrow, if they come up with a car, you're like, okay, well, well, Google is different, right? They can come up with a car or, or buy a company that, that does that as a car. But like, you know, if Nike tomorrow comes up and says, oh, well, I'm making, uh, you know, uh, umbrellas, people will be like, why are you making umbrellas? And I think that while, again, a language is developer tools, there was a lot of this mindset of like, well, you just do IDEs. Like you're doing, you're doing, IDEs and language and tools for other languages. Why do you want to create your own language? Like, and, and, and then, of course, the additional thing is just like, well, you're not just creating another version control, you're creating a language. And I think that there is this psychological barrier between what a language is and every other tool. Like with a language, people, it, they, you really need to convince them and they really need to see the value in order to adopt it. Because it's a lot of investment, it's a lot of risk. You know, like I, I'm gonna take my, like tomorrow if you take a company that, that is writing, for example, Java code and someone uses IntelliJ IDEA, which is our tool, and someone uses Eclipse, tomorrow if that person leaves and they choose, you know, they could just use the other IDE. Like it's not fundamental to the project's success or failure. Whereas with a language, it is, right? With a language, there is more commitment. You need to make sure that the people coming on board know the language, the people leaving don't leave you in the cold. So it is, it's much harder to just adopt a language than it is um, just a tool, right? Even though we feel it's essentially the same thing. But so I think that psychological barrier also pushes people back against this, if that makes sense. 
And that's a great segue, I think, to something that I wanted to get to, which are lessons that you learned in the process of developing Kotlin, which really, you know, has become preferred language for developing on the Android platform, right? What are the lessons that JetBrains learned in the process of overcoming that resistance, developing that language, and, and building the community, right? Saying, oh, well, you know, they're not just a maker of IDs. You know, they've got this language, and yeah, I'm pretty happy with it, and yeah, I'm going to adopt it. I think that, first of all, lessons learned. I mean, it's difficult a little bit to answer because it depends on who and what, right? Because there's so many people involved in Kotlin. I think the one thing that we, not that we would learn, but something that I, I feel in a sense we try to avoid is to be demotivated uh, with, with, with the initial reaction. Like if you look at the initial reaction, the there was some positiveness, right? And there were a few people in the community that said, oh, this looks interesting. Oh, this looks great. Maybe we should give it an opportunity. But there was also a lot of negativity. There was also a lot of like, stick to what you're doing. We don't need another language. This is very similar to existing languages. You're not providing value. And our persistence in, you know, taking the good feedback, building on it, and trying to ignore the negative that was really not constructive and persisting this i think was the the biggest uh lesson that i would say you know we also learned and also i think it's important for people right to take take the negativeness with a pinch of salt like listen to it but don't be demotivated if you have a clear vision if you have a clear idea where you're going try and follow that path right be be persistent with that and one other thing is that not a lot of people really know this but we never created Kotlin for, for, for Android. We, we created a language that we wanted to use for developing our own IDEs because we were tired of certain things with, uh, with the existing languages. And we said, okay, let's try and do this. And it, it's a good opportunity to also provide uh, other people better experiences. And uh, then, you know, early on, we got some feedback from a few folks saying, oh, I've tried it in Android, it doesn't work. And we said, well, you know, just, sorry, like Android isn't our focus. Uh, but then soon after, you know, we, we started to see, no, maybe it's not that hard to actually address this and maybe it might be a good opportunity, which was great, right? You know, like yeah, lesson learned, listen to the first time, right? Uh, but that's where it kind of, kind of started to pick up. Yeah, it's, uh, it's that, that idea of, um, you know, listening to people and, and understanding their, their needs and, and trying to put that in the same kind of like align it with the vision that you have uh, moving forward, I think is important. And I, I have to say, like, you know, we one thing that I feel like has characterized us over the years, and there's definitely lessons that we need to learn here. And there's definitely way, um, way I mean, room for improvement is that we are kind of open uh, around the, the stuff that we do, like the products that we build, the, the, the roadmaps, and, and try and listen as much as we can uh, to the community, right? But it's also, you know, when you are developing in the open and you get a lot of feedback, you need to balance between the vision and the way you want to go and where, you know, everyone wants to go. Who was it that famously said, you know, it, 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 was, it was Ford, right, that said right. about the cars? He would have given people, if, if he'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, how do you, I think that's a really important point because, you know, it's, it's companies throughout history, big and small that have to try and deal with that same issue. What was it like for JetBrains? I mean, you've got all this feedback coming in. Some of it's negative. Some of it might be constructive. You want to build a community. So you want you don't want to disenfranchise everyone. How did you strike that balance uh, in JetBrains' case? I think what we, we are more or less good at is in terms of reasoning with people. If you, I mean, if you look at JetBrains as a company, you know, generally we are, I mean, it started in, with three people back 20 years ago. Uh, when I joined, there was about 150 people, okay? Now there's about 1,400 people. Yet despite this, it is very flat in hierarchy. And I can never, like I don't generally, the way that it works is that you do not impose your ways at JetBrains. You say, okay, 
I think we should do this. Here's the millions of reasons why I feel this is strongly about this. But if whatever my position or title is, if someone comes up with good reasoning that we should do it a different way, we do it. So we try and reason everything. And when we want to add a feature to a, to a product, even within the teams, uh, we try and reason why this is valuable, why we should add it, why we should add it in this way. So I think that the Kotlin team has very, been very good at, and especially like you know Andre and uh, who's the the team lead for for Kotlin, he was always very good and uh, and receptive to ideas and giving people like the reasons why this may not work in the way it does. And I think that you know doing this in the open, for instance, like all of the we now have this process in the open where, which is called Kotlin evolution enhancement process where people actually can file for feature requests uh, on GitHub or on our issue tracker and they come up with a scenario and then we openly discuss it and we say, okay, well, this scenario may cover this, but it won't cover these things. So maybe it wouldn't be a good idea because it would open up the floodgates to all of these other issues. I think that generally seems to work, like being receptive to feedback, but trying to reason with people as to why we should or we shouldn't accept it. Do you think that that produces um, a more invested community? You know, this is something I talk to companies about um, on a regular basis, and it seems to be even more apparent when I talk to software companies and people doing open source development or, you know, that there's this expectation among developers, engineers, coders, you know, people involved in the development process, that there's an acceptance of this give and take. Hey, look, I'm going to put in a feature request. You're going to look at it. You're going to tell me about it. You're going to do... They're just more than, say, to use kind of an analogy, a car manufacturer. There seems to be something in the software community where that comes out more and, and when companies, when people working on projects can harness that and be transparent, they, they, they get a lot of rewards. People tend to approach that and say, oh yeah, that, you know, that they appreciate that. Even if the answer is no, or even if the answer is maybe unpopular, at least you had to prove to people through logic and reason. And, you know, like you described, Hey, here's why we're going to do this, or here's why we're not going to do this. I, it's a, it's funny actually because just a few days ago I, I tweeted I said that imagine if the if car manufacturers were to act the way we do as software developers you know someone files an issue for Tesla and says I want six wheels and if you don't give me six wheels I'm gonna go buy a Ford you know it's like you have to try and say okay like let's try and reason about why why you can't have six wheels or why we don't have the bandwidth to implement six wheels today. So yeah, I think there is a trade-off, um, but I think ultimately it it works out well. You know, one of one, one of the reasons that one of the things that I mean, talking about lessons learned, uh, when you have an issue tracker, which is basically where we you know file for for requests, for features, for bugs, whatever, that is open, which is our case, it's very very transparent. So we have, to, to, give, to give you an example, we've got an issue that has been there for like 12, 15 years, and it's got a lot of votes. And one lesson we learned that even if we don't have the bandwidth, even if we do not, um, you know, even have plans, like if we don't have plans to implement this, we should say it. We just say, look, it's not going to happen. And people value this transparency and they value this honesty. They value that you communicate which is the lessons that, that, that we learned, like communicate, tell them what's going on. Now, that is also sometimes hard, you know, when, when you have like, for example, a request that is, that is going on for five years, which shouldn't, but hey, you know, it's life. This is how things work. Uh, and you know, there's something going on for a long time. From your perspective, you're like, do I have to really send an update every six months and say, well, we're still not working on this. Well, we're still not working on this, right? So it, it's a very difficult balance. And then you get people coming and saying, oh, well, why are you ignoring us and, and stuff? And, and now, you know, with, with social media, it's kind of like crowd bashing, right? You know, I'll, look, JetBrains has ignored this issue for, for, you know, for four years. Let's all go and, and, and tell them off. Um, but I think that the important thing here is if you're transparent, 
if you say to people, look, this is, this is the plan, we're working on this, or we're not working on this, that is the most valuable thing. Some people might like it, some people might hate it, some people might say, well, if you're not going to work on this, I'm going to use competitor. But, you know, you can't, you know, make everyone happy all of the time, as they say, right? Was there a mistake that you think that, that you all made early, um, that you learned from, or that you see other companies kind of make? I mean, you've talked a lot about lessons. So was there something uh, that you say, you know, I, I wish we'd done this, um, th that serves as a warning for other um, people trying to build a community around um, either a language or a set of tools or a, a product or a platform? I think that the one lesson that we learned is that we need to communicate more with our users around the status of things. Okay. Like even when we feel that there is nothing to update, an occasional nudge by us saying, folks, we're still looking at this. It's still on the pipeline. We're going to get to it as soon as we can. People appreciate that. They don't feel like you're ignoring them. And I think that that is important. I wouldn't ever say that we made a mistake doing feature requests and bugs in the open. I think that that is very, very valuable. And it's, it's really given us that DNA of being as transparent as we can with our users and, and you know, providing them many communication channels. And I think that this is also a very important lesson for companies. You know, often when you look at companies, they, they look at it from the perspective of what is the most efficient way for us to provide support as opposed to why don't we enable as many channels as we can for the customers so that they don't have to make a massive effort to reach us. And I think that that's a very important uh, lesson that. So it's all about sort of lowering those barriers between yes, exactly. your, your customers, uh, the developers and then and, and you and, and making sure that people feel like, hey, look, you know, even if the answer is no, I got an answer. Do I think, think that that is important. Do you think that that's a requirement now to be successful um, in today's environment? I mean, it seems all it seems that that's just what people expect, whether it is, you know, your car company to some degree or it is software. Now, you know, I, I would agree with you. I, I think that there's certain audiences that are much more passionate um, and the uh, devs, you know, fit into that as, as, as someone who has an engineering and a, um, you know, uh, uh, learned to code on Fortran, you know, in, in Pascal back in the day, you know, I, I, you know, people sort of, you know, feel like, oh, like, you know, passionate about the things they work on, the languages they've spent time on, the tools they use, but it seems to permeate across a variety of, you know, products and companies that we sort of live today. It just seems to be the world that we're in. And so, um, I mean, do you think that that, you know, that, that's been your experience, it sounds like, with Kotlin, w with the other tools that JetBrains makes? I think it is critical. I, and I think that definitely if you want to build a community, you should be where the people are. You should be there for them. You should engage with them. You should interact with them. And you should be as transparent as you can with them. To, to try and build that trust and, and, and build a successful product around it. it. Otherwise, it just doesn't work, especially in our field. Like, and, and sure, like, you're absolutely correct. We, we've come to expect this, especially with social media. You know, like nowadays, but there, there's two types of companies, right? There's those companies that are actively there on social media, on different channels, trying to help you. And then there's those ones that want to do damage control, right? When, you know, you're being ripped off or someone or you're being ignored. I mean, yourself, you've probably seen a million times someone tweeting and saying, thank you very much, X, O, and Y for ignoring me, blah, blah, blah. And then immediately they respond to you on social media, right? And then there's other companies that, you know, I, I mean, I work with, I, back in the old days. I don't know if you remember, uh, we used to have these things. There was the airplanes that used to fly in the air. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, as a developer advocate, I used to fly around a lot. And, that, and there was two types of airlines. There was one that I could cancel, book, rebook, do everything I could over, over Twitter with them. And then there was the other one that their Twitter interaction was limited to please fill out this form or call this telephone number. I'm a fan of the first. 
And at the end of the day, the better that company treats you, the better you advocate for it, the better more word of mouth that company gets. So for us, if you want to build a community, you got to treat those people well. And then that flourishes in a good way. I mean, to, you know, we, we, to give you some numbers, when we started Kotlin, uh, in terms of a community, we used to use uh, the BB, uh, BBS. You remember the BBS? The old bulletin board services. IRC. IRC, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember the old bulletin board services too. So, you know, I, I, I used to use those back in college all the time, so. <laughs> Were they ASCII? <laughs> yep, yep, yep. But uh, we, we were on IRC and it was like six of us, literally like six of us, two of us from JetBrains and four other people and never anything went on. And then one day I, I said to my colleague, I'm like, you know what, maybe we should just try Slack. And we created a Slack channel. And then this started to build up, right? We now have, I think around 30,000 people on the Slack channel, okay? And there's like a hundred different channels on there and it's a very welcoming community, but that also takes time. It takes effort. You need to be there. You need to moderate, moderate. Like I'm, I'm there a lot of times. My colleagues are there a lot of times making sure we have code of conducts in place, making sure if anyone steps out of line, we kind of nudge them and say, look, this isn't the expected behavior. It, it's not only a matter of growing the community, but it's also important to keep that community friendly, a safe place and a welcoming place, which is just as, as critical as well. Well, honey, I think that's a great place uh, to end it. it. It's been great having you uh, on the show. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Thank you very much.